honor of having my brother-in-law here tonight, Steve Hardy. This is, you know, you're waving there. He's uh, Alice's older brother, and if you remember Jeannie and Larry, that's Jeannie's older brother. So he's the number one. And uh, uh, of course, my mother-in-law passed away. It's almost been a year now. And uh, uh, if you listen to Alice, she'll say that was mom's favorite right there. <laughs> but uh, good people. You know, yeah, amen. Yeah, it's true. It is true. Uh, but uh, uh, he lives all the way in Florida. And he's back out here to visit dad a little bit. And uh, uh, so it's, it's good to see you, Steve. Good to have you here. Take your Bibles, if you will, and I want to ask that you take notes on tonight. I'm going to give you some scripture and some verses, and uh, we're going to be talking tonight about how that we need to pray for the lost. We need to pray for the lost. It was interesting. It was interesting last night. Last night, uh, Alice and I and Steve were sitting around talking. About is this thing on? We were talking about people that are lost and witnessing and what have you, and that's where I'm at tonight. So if you turn to First Timothy chapter two, First Timothy chapter two, <coughs> how many have a pen and a piece of paper you can write on? You have something? You have something? Wanda has a crayon. Who Wanda has a crayon? That'll work. That'll work. I've seen some pretty good crayon stuff done before. Wanda, put that songbook down. Okay. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. The Bible says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Interesting verse there, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. <laughs> is your wife life kind of quiet and peaceable, or is it in an uproar? Maybe we're not praying like we should. Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Who will have all men to be saved. All men, not just a select few, but all men. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. It's been said that prayer is the lifeline of New Testament evangelism. The oxygen for its holy fire. There is no evangelism. Listen to me. There is no evangelism without prayer and no prayer that does not lead on to reaching the lost for Christ. Uh, all Christians should feel the urgent need to pray. You know, we talk a lot about being a witness and testimony. We talk a lot about those divine appointments. But do we actually pray in preparation for them? Are we praying, God, lead me to whomever it is today that you want me to talk to? It may turn out that it's somebody you just met. You don't know. But if God avails you the opportunity, you need to do it. i got to tell you, Steve, you get a kick out of this. Uh, it was uh, my father-in-law was on the phone. He's always talking to someone about insurance or something. And uh, <clears throat> he had this person on the phone. He didn't know who they were. Alice came up and she said, he's on the phone with Kaiser. I said, okay. And he said, uh, you're in Bakersfield? Yeah. So we're in Bakersfield, they said, evidently. Where do you go to church? I mean, just out of the blue. Where do you go to church? He's probably been talking less than a minute. Where do you go to church? Oh. Well, have, a, have you ever tried a Baptist church? That's a pretty good church. Then he said, my son-in-law actually pastors down where I pastored like 55 years ago. And he's just taking the opportunity to be a witness and testimony. It's amazing. Um, you know, he's one of those few people that when you see him in church and you see him outside of the church, it's the same person. It's the same person. And how we should desire to all be like that, the consistency. I had a professor tell us one time, the most difficult thing you'll be 
uh, that you'll ever be in your life is just simply to be consistent. Just to be consistent. But we need to be praying that God would lead us to whomever it is that he wants us to be a witness and testimony for. Or it may be simply that we're just simply praying for someone to be saved. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but how many have a list right now of people that you're praying for that they'll be saved? A lot of people, a lot of people don't do that. We'll pray, we'll pray generically, but we don't pray. Why should we pray for the lost? Well, here's four reasons. First, we should pray for the lost because of God's heart. God's heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, people that don't even know the Bible know this verse. They know this verse. This is God's heart. For God so loved the world. You know, what's important to my heavenly Father ought to be important to me. It ought to be important to me. My dad went home to be with the Lord last October. I was driving down the road today and thinking, Dad, I sure miss you. I wish I could talk to you. I miss him. But when I was growing up and doing things, I wanted to do things that would please my father. And I like to know what my father's heart was. My dad was quite a musician, could play several instruments, great singer. And uh, so we would play a little bit of music with him, what have you. And I wanted to please my father. Do you want to please your heavenly father tonight? John 3.17 says, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now if you're taking notes, if you simply list maybe a heading like we should pray for the lost because of God's, father, uh, God's heart, and then write down the scriptures there so you can reference them. You can reference them. And these will be good scriptures that you can use from time to time in being a witness and testimony. Sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know, why would a loving God send you to hell? Well, he's not. He's made preparation for that. He's made a way of escape, and that was through his son. You take these two verses together, and they tell that God's love motivated him. God's love motivated. God's love for us, for mankind, motivated him to the point where he sent his son into the world to die for us through the sacrifices of his son. 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you want to turn there, you can. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 tells us more about God's heart. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Would have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it tells us that God is patient. God is patient, not willing that any should perish, not willing that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. See, it's in God's plan that all men should be saved. Are we just simply doing our part? Are we simply being available? Are we taking the opportunity to do that? And it's all without exception. When it says all men, he means all. There's no exception. Even Hitler, Christ died for Hitler. It's hard for us to fathom that. But you know what? If you start to get closer to God, the closer you get to God, the more the, more the ugliness of sin, I think, is revealed to us. And then you realize the ugliness of our own sinful condition. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Talking about my heart. It's talking about our heart this evening. But he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance without exception. Secondly, we should pray for the lost because of Christ's sacrifice. Because of his sacrifice. In Luke 19.10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save. That was, that was, and then you get the, how's it finish up? 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
I wrote it down incorrectly. And he died to provide a way of salvation for the whole human race. The whole human race. Back to our text, uh, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. One God. You know, tonight we have the opportunity to pray. We're meeting with the one and true living God tonight. I don't think we even can really fathom that. But he, we are. Tonight we're meeting with him. And we have the ability to worship the one and the true living God who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified. Thirdly, we should pray for the lost because of Paul's example. Paul had, uh, Paul was quite a man. I mean, he was quite a, a Jew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, the Bible tells us. He was a pretty sharp fellow, and he persecuted the church. But Jesus saved him on the road to Damascus. And as much as he was against the church, he just turned 180 degrees the other direction and began to follow Christ. He said in Romans 10.1, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for, for Israel is that they might be saved. That's my prayer. Are you praying for your lost loved ones? Are you praying for your lost relatives? Are you praying for your lost neighbors? Are we praying for America? Hmm. If Paul felt so concerned that he prayed for his own people, shouldn't we do the same? Shouldn't we do the same? You know, my family, of course, there's a lot younger ones under us now. We pray for the grandchildren, for the salvation of our grandchildren. Of course, at first it was praying for the children. And, you know, have we lost that? Have we lost that? Don't, don't quit praying. Don't quit praying. Fourthly, we should pray for the lost because of their condition. Because of their condition. You see, the lost are hopeless and helpless without Christ. Just like we were. We were hopeless and helpless without Christ. There's nothing I could do to earn my salvation. I'm not good enough to go to heaven. I am not perfect. I needed a kinsman redeemer. The New Testament in many places reveals us to us how hopeless and how helpless they are. In First Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four, it says, "In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them." How many times have you talked to someone? Are you saved? If you were to die tonight, right now, do you know that you go to heaven? And you get so many different answers. Well, I've been pretty good. I had one fellow tell me that he had a particular experience. And he said, I was going to be in deep trouble, Don. And he said, I just prayed to God that he'd get me out of this. And I got out of it. And that was his salvation. His eyes have been blinded. Blinded by the God of this world. They're blind. We should pray for the lost because they're blind. We should pray for the lost because of their condition, because they are captive to Satan. 2 Timothy 2.26 says, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So many people that go to a lot of different churches that don't know the true and the living God, and that they're good and seemingly moral people, but they are captive by Satan. They're condemned. In John 3 18, those verses 3, 16, 17, and 18 are good to put to memory. He that believeth on him is not condemned. You believe in Jesus Christ, you're saved, you're not condemned. No longer am I condemned. But it goes on and says, But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. They're also dead. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1. They're bound for hell. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. That's John 3.36. John 3.36. Stop and think that we have escaped the wrath of God. Praise God. Praise God. They're helpless. The Bible says, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. John 6, 44. 
their hope. They're hopeless, having no hope, and yet without God in the world, Ephesians 2.12. The Bible says they are without understanding. We're praying for the lost because they are without understanding. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. How many times do you see people scoff at those that might take the gospel to someone? And they'll laugh and they'll joke about it because they seem foolish to them. They seem foolish to them. Why? They're spiritually dead. They're spiritually dead. You can take any one of these verses and preach an entire sermon on them if you want it. But these are some verses on why we need to pray for the lost. It's the plight of those without Christ. Think about this. What do you say to a dead person? What do you say? Dead men can't hear. We are kind of talking about this last night, Steve. Dead men can't hear. And when you're talking to someone about the Lord and their need of a Savior, you need to understand that they are spiritually dead. They are spiritually dead. They are blind, and, but they think they can see. They de they're dead, but they think they're alive. They're captive by Satan, but they think they're free. They're helpless. They think they can do anything. But they're without understanding, even though they think they know everything. Hmm. But a dead person, spiritually dead person, physically alive, and he hears your words. You know how many times we talk to our children, and you'll say, listen to what I'm saying. And then you'll stop yourself and you'll say, did you hear what I said? Sometimes we hear the, uh, uh, kind of like uh, the Snoopy, rah, 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 how Snoopy makes the noise. We've ever watched those cartoons. And that's Snoopy talk. And I think sometimes our children hear that. Uh, 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 but they're listening they hear that, but they don't hear us. They don't hear us. And we need to pray that God will open the eyes of those that we're talking to. See, a lot of times we go in and we might be bold enough to just stand before someone and, and, and tell them about the Savior. And that's good to tell them about what happened in your life. I've heard that a lot. Well, just tell them what happened in your life. And that's good. But we need to be concerned that we're using God's words as we're talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't need it to be my words. Matter of fact, when I deal with someone about salvation and I'll give them all the information and I'll say, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Where are you at in this decision? Well, I'd like to receive Christ as my Savior. And I'll say, go ahead and pray. And they'll kind of look at me. I said, if you understand what I'm saying, it's no magic words that I'm going to give you. You need to ask from your heart that God will save you. That God will save you. So we need to pray. We need to pray for the lost. It's preparation. It's preparation that they might be saved. How should we pray for the lost? How should we pray for the lost? Well, that's where the Christians come in. Christians should speak to the lost. Mike, we should speak to the lost. We should talk to the lost. We need to pray for workers. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, then saith he, this is Jesus, unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are fruit, few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's you and I. That's you and me. We are the laborers. We're to go into the harvest fields and help to reap the harvest. We should pray that God would move our hearts. I should pray, God, give me a heart for the lost. I'm talking seriously here tonight because I think a lot of times we think we know all these things and maybe we do but we never get it into us and we never let it come out of us. We should pray that God will raise up more workers. We should pray that evangelists would come in. We have some that come here to this church and I look at them and I think that's an evangelist. That's because they're always witnessing. They're always talking to the, someone about the Lord and their need of a Savior. And they just live for that. We should pray for workers. But not only should we pray for workers, we need to pray for boldness. 
Because what happens? We come away from church and we're inspired and we're encouraged by the Word of God and what we're to do. God has a plan for our life that we should be about His business. And then we have an opportunity and we chicken out. We chicken out. In verses, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, it says, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. Boldly. Why? Why can't we be bold? Because we're speaking God's words, not ours. Be boldly, my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in my bonds. That man that seemed to always be in prison. That therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And that's interesting to note here. Paul in prison, he didn't back down. He just laid it out there. This is what it's about. This is what's going on. We've all had these situations. We chicken out. Or become intimidated or worried. Or suddenly we get tongue-tied. I get tongue-tied, it seems, at times. Seems like a lot. I remember I have a, uh, a friend of mine that's a pastor. He stands about this tall. We used to go into L.A. to the uh, parks in the Sunday afternoon. And Tim would go down there, and he would find the biggest group of guys and get right in the middle of them and start talking to them about the Lord, the Lord and the need of a Savior. He was quite a soul winner, quite a soul winner. Uh, not only was he leading people to the Lord every uh, every week, but he went for 26 consecutive weeks, I remember, that he had somebody that he had led to the Lord, and they walked the aisle, and they received, they were baptized. We need to pray for boldness. Why? We've got something to say. You know, I'm not real bold in most things. We're talking about discussions and opinions. I'm completely confident and uh, uh, comfortable in my own opinion. I do not have to share it. And the reason I don't do that a lot of times is because I get put down. Well, that's silly. That's stupid. <laughs> you know, you have to, somebody to look at you and you know, oh, that's a strange thought. But I'm bold inside. But we don't want to stand up and be bold for Christ. But we do have something to say. When he's talking about here, open my mouth boldly, words implying the freedom of speech. Just lay it out there. Here's the truth. We need to pray for opportunities, thirdly. We need to pray for an opportunity. I think a lot of times we'll sit and we'll say, well, I'll be a witness and testimony if somebody comes up to me. But well, we need to pray for the opportunity. We need to be active in our prayer. <clears throat> we need to be praying that God's going to give us an open door. God, you know, as we start our day off and hopefully with prayer and maybe some Bible time, we should pray, God, give me an open door today to present the gospel, to present the gospel. You know, most of us here can comfortably go up and talk to anybody, and we can say just about anything, talk about the weather or what have you, and we're not too bad about that. But what is it about us not being able to walk up and tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ? We should be able to do that. And we need to pray for clarity, pray for clarity that in verse uh, Colossians chapter 4, 4, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Clarity. Presenting it in a clear, concise manner so it can be understood. We need to pray not only that we have an opportunity, but we need to pray that the lost might listen. Might listen. Proverbs 21, 1 reminds us that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water... He trieth it whithersoever, whithersoever he will. Whithersoever he will. You see, when you begin to witness in testimony, you need to understand. It's kind of like when I began to pastor the church here. The first, some of the first thoughts, you, you, you're, you're in your human thoughts and what have you. I think, I cannot do it. And the Holy Spirit said, that you're exactly right. You cannot do it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And that's what we need to remember when we're being a witness and testimony. It's Christ working in us. We're simply his vessel. But we need to pray that there'll be receptive hearts, receptive hearts. Secondly, we should pray that their spiritual eyes would be opened. To open their 
eyes and turn them from the darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Acts 26, 18. Think about that. You've got con three contrasts in that scripture. It talks about opening their eyes. You're going from closed eyes to open eyes. You're going from darkness to light, and you're going from Satan to God. All in that verse. You do not find a better description of true conversion in the New Testament. Thirdly, we should pray that the sinner might have God's attitude towards sin. And I'll tell you what, we could probably park right here and talk quite a bit about this. Because Christians, we need to have God's attitude about sin. How many of us have got our own little sins that we kind of tuck away, we have to ourselves, and we're comfortable with them, but if our brothers and sisters in Christ saw us, they would say, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, <clears throat> John 16, 8 tells us, says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit will break the sinner's heart. But we also need to pray as Christians that God would break our hearts if we are wrapped up in sin. We need to have God's attitude of sin. And fourthly, we should pray that the sinner might be released to trust Christ. Pray for the harvest. Isaiah 61.1 says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Jesus came to those who lived a long life in a dark prison. And that's where you and I were, in a dark prison. As we pray for the lost, we should focus our prayers by asking God to break the chains and set them free so they can trust the Savior. And fifthly, we need to pray for a life that's transformed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How about you, Christian? Are all things still new in your life? Are they new things that you're doing? You see, true conversion, and we don't talk a lot about this, but true conversion causes us to transform. We have a lot of Christians that are very easy uh, very comfortable in living their life. They got saved to receive Christ as their Savior, but they've never grown. Where's the transformation? Does God speak to your heart? Do you speak to Him? I'd be concerned about that. You know what God's biggest problem is in all this? It's not the lost. It's the Christian. It's the Christian. We don't pray for those as we ought to. But we need to pray and preach the gospel because that's God's ordained method. That's the way it's going to happen. That's the way it's going to happen. <coughs> we need to talk to God about people before we talk to people about God. And that's the point of this message. We need to pray. We need to pray. You know, we could have a wonderful program and we need to get something going again where we're actively going out and trying to reach the lost. But if we just simply come here and go out without praying, we've done it entirely wrong. We're going in our own power. All somebody will say, was we gather, well, we need to pray. Well, that's good. But we should be in a constant attitude of prayer that God, you're going to direct me to those that need to hear from you today. It's not my words. It's not my works. It's Him. Where do we apply this message? How do we, how do we make this personal? First thing I would say to do is take and make a list. Take and make a list of lost people that you know and begin to pray for them. I would start making a list even tonight. Make a list. Keep that list by your bed and pray for them on purpose. Pray daily for God to work in their hearts. You may not see them every day. They may be halfway across the world. I don't know. But pray for them. Second thing, get together with another Christian and pray for the lost. Where's your list? Here's my list. Here, make a copy of my list. I'll make a copy of your list. 
And let's pray for the lost together. Third, as God begins to answer your prayer, write down those answers. Write down those answers. That will be a way to encourage you. Keep that by your list. Keep that by your list as you see God moving. Sometimes you will become discouraged. You may not see any fruit of what's going on. You know, we don't always see the fruit. When you're tossing the seed out, you don't always see what happens. But continue to pray. But keep a list of those answers to prayer. And fourthly, be ready to be a part of the answer to your own prayers. In other, in other words, put feet to your prayers. Put feet to your prayers. I've been praying for this person. God, I feel impressed by you. I need to talk to them today. Put feet for your prayers. You need to remember that someone prayed for you. Someone prayed for you. Story about George Miller here. George Miller. He was known of as a man of prayer. and He lived his life by faith. He never asked funds for the orphanage. And somehow God would just miraculously supply. Miraculously supply said that he provided for over 10,000 orphans in that 60 years. Can you imagine? Wow, just God meeting the need. He said toward the end of his life, he had prayed for two men to be saved for over 55 years. For over 55 years, he prayed for these two men in particular to be saved. He said that shortly before he died, one of them got saved. And then one after, after he died, one got saved. The other got saved. But somebody asked him before they got saved, it said, 55 years, he said, do you feel like giving up? Someone asked him. Oh, no, he replied. Now listen to his, his mindset. Oh, no, he replied. Why would God give me such a burden for these men if he didn't intend to save them? God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Who are you praying for? Who are you praying for? Somebody prayed for you. Let's pray. Father, I thank